absolutely an honor to speak to you all tonight, and I'm so inspired by all the women who've already shared, and I'm excited to get into God's word. Please turn with me to Psalm 91, and we're going to read an incredible prophetic story. Psalm 91, verse 9. The Bible says, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now this psalm is prophetic of Jesus, how he triumphed over Satan and the angels attended him in the desert, but it's also prophetic of us, prophetic of you. That because you call on God, he would answer you, let no harm overtake you, deliver you, satisfy you, and one day show you his salvation. We serve a God not just of deliverance, but the most galactic deliverance ever. And think of the people he's delivered. Sarah doesn't just have a baby at 90 years old, but God allows her to become the mother of nations. The bleeding woman doesn't just end a 12-year period, which obviously sounds terrible, right? But she talked to everyone, and everywhere the gospel is read, her story is preached as an example of hope, of healing, and of faith. Jesus doesn't just overcome death on a cross, but he resurrected and sits on the right hand of God. And Mary Magdalene doesn't just get seven demons exercised out of her, but she gets to be a woman in Jesus' ministry, the very first to see Jesus resurrect and the one to go back and tell the other apostles. We serve a God of ultimate deliverance. And that is the title of my lesson tonight, Ultimate Deliverance. And we're going to study out a story where we see this take place in none other than Queen Esther. So please turn me turn with me to Esther chapter 2. So this is about a hundred years after the Babylonian exile and we have four main characters. There's a king, King Xerxes, who's crazy rich and in search of a new queen. We have Mordecai, a Jew that saves the king from assassination. We have Esther, his niece, who gets drafted into a beauty pageant against her will. And Haman, the villain who's power hungry and gets mad that Mordecai doesn't bow down to him. So he gets the king to agree to kill all the Jews. Very rational response, obviously. So I love the word of God. It's very entertaining. And there's so much to unpack, but we're going to pick up at the finale of the pageant. In Esther chapter 2, verse 12. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women. Six months of oil with myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she'd go there and in the morning, return to another part of the harem to care to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihel, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. She was really humble. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was very winsome. 
She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. Now, the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Point number one, you were crowned. After a year of beauty treatments, Esther goes in to see the king, and out of all the women there, Esther wins. Esther gets delivered. She wins the king's favor and becomes the queen. And I love that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10, the Bible tells us that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. A holy nation, God's special possession. Why? So that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once we were not a people of God, but now we get to be the people of God. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. And so think of the day when you were saved. When you became a baptized disciple, you went from darkness into God's light. And he says you became a holy nation and his special possession. Now think of your special possession. What are some of the things that are the most precious and that we hold near and dear to our hearts? What are some of the things that we have? Wedding rings, yep, phones. Passport, oh yeah, you ain't getting nowhere without that. Cameras, exactly. Your dog, family, you know. And so when I think of one of my most special possessions, I think of cards. I'm like very words of affirmation, like tell me how much you love me. I just want to hear it. I'm like, stop, you know. That can be who I am. And so when, uh, when Ole and I were dating, he would write me a card every month. And I just could not wait to open it up. I cherished the words, had like a little routine, like my nightlight, my little cookie, just reading the note. It was so weird, it's weird. But I loved it. But I also loved receiving notes from my little sisters. I'm the oldest of six. And one of my favorite notes was from my youngest, where she's like, you're such a good disciple. I was like, you see? you know it's so special but even friends who've impacted me throughout my life because these for me represent instances of being seen seen by the people that I love but even more than that God says magnify that love by one billion and that's how special you are to me that's how much I treasure you let me share a few words written by an unknown author but it's so true If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring. He sends you a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he listens. He can live anywhere in the universe, but he chose your heart. Face it, sisters. He's crazy about you. He delivered you from the darkness that took you captive, the impurity, immorality, insecurity, the bitterness, workaholism, drunkenness, believing that we had to earn our worth instead of truly seeing that Jesus valued us enough to die on the cross for us. Think about that. He loved you enough to die for you because you were already worth it. And I ask you to think of these things because there was a time in my walk with God where I completely lost sight of it. I'd been a Christian for several years at this point in leadership, balancing school, work, family, like many of us. And I started to do things for God and not with God. You know what I mean? I started to feel like I needed to be great at everything, reading my Bible, praying, sharing, but I stopped letting God into my heart. My schedule was so strict, I only had 30 minutes for my quiet time, and that's it. 
And before that 30 minutes ended, I was already thinking of my next meeting. I didn't even give my whole heart. Serving, but thinking about all the things that are not efficient. Working, complaining, getting open, but discipling myself so no one can actually disciple me. And it really came from a place of deep sadness. Sadness of where things were in my family, fear of my future, insecurity that I wasn't doing enough for God, but also incredible burnout. Can anyone relate? Yeah. Am I the only one? Okay, okay, thank you. And so what I learned during this time was that I was trying to do Christianity without Christ. I was doing these things for God, and they were even about God, but I wasn't doing it with God. Working to earn approval from God, from people, and at times, just so I didn't drown in the avalanche of things I had going on, and I let myself get to a place where I remember I didn't want to come to midweek. I was like, I could get more homework done during this time. Where as soon as church service ended, I was out. Where I would show up to Bible talk and not say anything. Where I gave my tithe because it was the right thing to do, but it stopped coming from a place of gratitude for the sacrifice that Jesus had made for me. And so I remember two of my friends, um, two of the sisters, they took me out to dinner, AKA an intervention. But I was really grateful because friends don't let friends get lukewarm, okay? And so they asked me, how are you really doing? I'm tired. That's how I was really doing. I felt like I was drowning and no one noticed. And this is what I shared with them. I feel like I've given so much and I don't owe anyone anything. That's where I got in my heart. They listened and they told me I needed to go on a date with God. And I looked at them and I was like, that sounds nice. Don't you think I would want to do something like that? Which ball do you want me to drop? I don't have the time. And so they shared with me Isaiah 32, verse 17. You can write it down. And it says, the fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. And one of them turned to me and they're like, Regine, the fact that you don't have peace, according to the scriptures, it's because you're not being righteous. I was shook. What? Me? I know I'm the problem and I'm the solution, but I really thought this time everybody else was the problem, you know? I was hurting, so how could it be me? I really didn't think I was the villain. And so she kept sharing Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And she was sharing how it probably stemmed from the fact that I was praying ineffectively, where I was praying about the problems, but I was not praying with thanksgiving. And that's where the peace lies. There was actually a lot that I was feeling that was wrong that I was not taking to God. I didn't feel special. I felt alone, left to suffer alone, grieve alone, left to help all of his people alone. So much so that I stopped letting him be with me. And so the next day, God actually canceled two of my appointments. I canceled a meeting, and I went on a date with God. And I prayed. I asked God to soften my heart and spent almost two hours just writing down what I was grateful for, remembering that I was crowned. And I still have that list to this day. And it moved me to see God's hand in my life, even though my heart had gotten so hard that I almost missed it and kept walking away from it. And what's really special about the book of Esther, it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't actually mention God by name. And yet all through it, you see the works of his hands. And so sometimes we don't see God. That doesn't mean he's not working. And so one question, sisters, are you doing Christianity without Christ? Are you in the word of God, but allowing yourselves to walk away unchanged, doing his work, but it feels like a burden because you're playing God, trying to control people's decisions instead of trusting him with their hearts? Well, I want to encourage you. No, 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 no. I want to empower you that you are still God's special possession, that he has still crowned you and he still wants to deliver you. And if you're too busy for God, then you're just too busy. 
You got to take something out. And so I just want to give you guys this practical to go on a date with God this week. A deep, intimate, unrushed, quiet time where you get to reflect on all that he's done for you and how he's crowned you. If I can do it, you can do it. But more than that, God looks forward to meeting you there. Let's turn back to the scriptures. Esther chapter 4, verse 7 through 14. So Mordecai told him everything that happened, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. And so word gets out that all the Jews are being killed. And so Mordecai tries to plead with Esther. In verse 9, Verse 10, then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Don't think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And so Mordecai is distraught, and he begs Esther to plead with the king on behalf of her people, but Esther's in a tough situation because she could potentially die by putting her life at risk and saying something. But Mordecai speaks the truth in love. Here's the thing, Esther. There will be deliverance, but maybe this is why you're here. Point number two, the time is now. Sometimes we can easily and naturally drift. Here she is. She got a chance to see her life get saved. She's chosen by the king, but she got to a place where she was comfortable, right? We can start off on fire for God, but a lot of it gets taken away as time passes by. We start to want the world again. We get captive to our sin again. Or we completely get people focused and lose sight of the king. So sometimes God allows storms to happen to see who's really on the rock. When we give up everything for God, it's not just a one-time thing. It's something that we have to continually do for the rest of our lives. But we understand it's not our name on a church membership that gets us into heaven. It's our willingness to truly hold on to Jesus' teachings. And so God has called us, sisters, for such a time as this. We're not here to decide the righteousness the standards of righteousness in the church. We're here to take a stand for the standards already set by our Father in heaven. He left everything we need to know in the word of God. And we can't let our comfort or our sentimentality prevent us from honoring God in this way. I appreciate our leaders, Jason and Sarah Dimitri. And I'm grateful for the commitment that they have for upholding God's standard for the church. I want to share a snippet from Jason's sermon this past Tuesday on the three non-negotiables of Christianity. You'll want to write this down. The first non-negotiable is commitment. In 1 John 2, verse 3 to 6, the Bible reads, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. We actually have to live like Jesus. Every single disciple has to be called to the standard of total commitment. Here's the thing. We can be weak all day long. How I have been weak many, 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 many times. But there's a difference between being weak and being unwilling. It's totally understandable to have a lot on our plates, but it's totally unacceptable to let those things prevent us from worshiping our true God. God bought the church with his blood. And the unwavering commitment that he has made to us when he got down on his knees right? 
through commitment, that's his plan to strengthen us. And so if he's unwavering in his commitment to us, we have to be unwavering in our commitment to him. The second non-negotiable is sound doctrine. In 1 Titus 9 through chapter 2, verse 1, we're just going to read verse 9 and verse 1 of chapter 2. But it says, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And what the Bible says is that it's absolutely okay to ask questions, right? We encourage questions. But when someone shows you the word of God, that is the unfallible, unchanging, unmoving word of God. And we cannot argue with scriptures. And so if someone is bringing in different convictions outside of what God has already established, that threatens the purity of his church. We have to be able to hold on to that standard and to keep it higher than anything else. The third non-negotiable is contempt and divisiveness. And you can write down Deuteronomy 17, verse 10 through 13, and Titus 3, verses 10 to 11. And so what contempt is, it's an unwillingness to listen or respond to judgment. And so it's after bringing in God's word that someone still chooses not to listen. But what, um, what divisiveness is, is now you're starting to get people away from the truth. And so sometimes people will say things like, they love people and they want them to read their Bibles every day. They meet in small groups and study out the scriptures. They collect money to plant 30 churches in a year. Yeah, we do all of that, you know? But sometimes people will say it in these voices or with these attitudes where it makes it sound like it's almost unbiblical, you know? And some of us get down on how fast we're going. Let me ask you this. Do you think God wants to evangelize this world? Does he want it to happen slowly or quickly? Because my Bible says that the day of salvation is now. And so the issue is never that we're going too fast. We're going on God's speed. We all know someone right now who doesn't know the Lord, who's lost and could be hurting for eternity if we don't do something about it. And so my application for this one is, are any of you or a sister you know struggling with any of these three non-negotiables? And have you spoken the truth and love to them the way that Mordecai did to Esther so that she didn't stay in a place of comfort that would have led to her death? Have you sounded the alarm so that we can help strengthen them? We have to be our sister's keeper and the time is now. We wouldn't be here if those in the first century weren't totally committed. And our commitment gets to be the foundation of the many who come after us. And so if you're visiting us today, ask the person who invited you out to do a Bible study. And please come to Women's Day, random plug. But it'll be an opportunity to hear the testimonies of the incredible women who've been changed by God's word because they were totally committed and made the faithful decision to live by it. All right, we're going to go back to Esther. Last section, Esther 4, verses 15 to 17. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do, when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Point number three, ultimate surrender is ultimate deliverance. So Esther decides to do it. And as the story goes on, we know that she's able to save not only herself, but her people. And Haman actually has to pay for his evil ways. But the reason why God was actually able to use her was because she was totally surrendered. It wasn't about what she could do, but what God could do through her. And we understand that God can use anyone who's totally surrendered. Is there something you desire for God to deliver you from right now? 
Are you in a season of waiting on a dream job? The dream guy? <laughs> I'm mad. Or maybe a transformation in yourself or someone you love. All of these things are noble things. But have you put conditions to what you're willing to endure or suffer in order to fully trust God through it? Some of us want to be happy, but we've stopped seeking God with our whole hearts. Some of us want to be healed, but we're unwilling to be vulnerable and talk about the pain that we've been through. Some of us want things, but we're so scared to pray about it for fear that it won't happen. God wants to grant us these desires, but we have to be totally surrendered. In Luke 14, 25 to 33, we learn about how in order to become a true disciple, we have to give up everything. And when we give up everything, we get to join the army of the king with 20,000, who's God's. And I love that scripture because what that means is everything that belongs to God, when you surrender everything, now those things belong to you too. You get to be under the king's protection, under his power, live in his land, everything. And it's the same thing that happened to Esther. She got an extension of the king's power. And it's the same thing that happens to us when we completely surrender. We get to have an extension of God's power. But we have to get to a place of total surrender. So how did Esther do it? Through prayer and fasting. We have to pray and fast for surrender. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, the Bible says to pray continually. In the interlinear, what that word pray continually means, it's to exchange a desire or a wish. And so in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, it says to put off the old self for the new self, and it means the same word of exchange, to be made new in the attitudes of your mind. And that word renew, it means to reach a new level of spiritual comprehension, to reason in a way that's holy, meaning through scripture and a deep understanding of God's character. So just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was like, is there any other way? I don't want to do this. But he got to a place of, but not my will, but your will be done, God. We have to be aware of what we're praying for and thinking in order to actually surrender it to God. And we have to know what God's will is in order to want his will. And so Esther desired to live, but God called her to put her life on the line. And he was able to use that to deliver an entire nation. So ladies, each of your conversions is a story of deliverance. And through prayer and fasting, actually being real with what you want and studying the Bible to know what God wants, you'll be able to better align your will to God's so that you can remain in that place of total surrender so you can ultimately get delivered by God. And so, in conclusion, Esther did not just win a beauty pageant. She saved an entire nation of Jews and was an instrument of God's ultimate deliverance. We don't just do Bible studies. It's a door to an incredible opportunity to build a relationship with God. You did not just get baptized as a disciple, but you were saved and received a piece of God's incredible spirit. And as Women's Day approaches, we're not just handing out an invite, we're providing a life-changing opportunity for women to connect with the greatest love of their lives. Here's the thing, ladies. We will never be ready to answer God's call, but we can be willing now. Sometimes we can be limited in seeing who we are now, but God sees the woman that we're going to be through the hardships and the trials if we take a stand for his word, because we serve a God of ultimate deliverance. Thank you.